Through you, say I can do anything. Yes, I can do all things. Cause it's you who gives me strength. For nothing is impossible. Through you, the blind eyes are open. And the strongholds are broken. I am living my faith.
for I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the
because he's worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Who gives this to us? Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Him the praise. He is so worthy. Amen. He is so worthy. We are still in our series of pray. And each week uh, that we've done a series, I give you the definitions that we added to prayer through the first three weeks. So I'm going to continue to do that till the end of the series. We probably have another maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks in this series. Um, and like I said, we're doing a sub-series now with God Answers Prayer. But here's what we said. Here's the definitions we gave to prayer in those first three weeks. Prayer is a relationship wherein we humbly communicate, worship, and sincerely seek God's face, knowing that he hears us, loves us, and will respond, though, though, though not always in a manner we may expect or desire. I will tell you this. You know, yesterday, you know, since we knew they were having a wedding outside, we prayed that it would not rain. It did not rain. So God answered prayer. But I probably should have been a little bit more specific in my prayer. I said, Lord, no rain in 80 degrees or 85 degrees. But, hey, it was good. It went well. But, like I said, he will always answer your prayer, not, again, not necessarily in the way you expect or desire. Okay, prayer is a privilege God gives us where he lets us participate in his will being accomplished on earth. And then prayer is a two-way conversation with God. Remember that. Prayer is a two-way conversation with God. We're not just supposed to sit there and just pour everything out to him and say, okay, bye. I mean, think about it. If someone called you up on the phone and you said hello, and all of a sudden for, for one minute, five minutes, ten minutes, however long you normally pray, whatever that is, and as soon as they got done saying what they were saying, go, click, you know, amen, goodbye, you know, you'd go, what did they call me for? Because you, if you were telling somebody on the other line, on the other side, other end of the phone, something, you'd be expecting what? Something for them to make a response in return, whether it's been, oh, okay, or whatever, you know? So it is a two way conversation. And then we, we asked this in, in, a, in one of the weeks, we said, why pray? And the simplest answer is this Jesus did. Jesus prayed. So our PRAY acronym, Praise, Repent, Ask, and Yield, it shows us. A simple framework for prayer that Jesus gave us so that we can keep our prayers fresh and growing. But again, but the best prayer lesson of all is summed up in Nike's cell slogan, which is what? Everybody tell me. Just do, it. Just do it. Because again, no matter how much we talk about prayer, no matter how much we study prayer, nothing can take the place, nothing can substitute actually praying, actually talking with God. That's simply what prayer is. Again, the simplest definition of prayer is just simply talking to God. And remember, Jesus didn't use the expression, if you pray, but when you pray. Okay? Now, then two weeks ago, we started this, and we the sub-series called God Answers Prayer. And understand this, God has filled the Bible with stories of answered prayer. People, people implored God to intercede in their messy life, in their messy lives, and guess what? He did. He came in and he interjected himself, and he would answer the prayer. And as we look at these incredible stories of answered prayers, I want you to notice two aspects. Number one, the attitude and motives of the person who prayed, and then number two, the power with which God answers prayer. And my, and my goal is, my hope is that these stories would change the way you pray and change how your prayers get answered. To help you to, to really expect God to move on your behalf. The first one we looked at in the first week of this was we looked at Hannah. We learned three things from her. The first one was this. Pray with all your heart. Number two, pray for the right reasons. And three, be patient. Three is probably one of the hardest ones. But again, pray with all your heart, 
pray for the right reason, and be patient. So today we're going to look at a guy by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of my, my, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Um, he is one of two kings over the nation of Judah. In fact, it's over, over Israel, whether the, over the divided kingdom. He's one of two kings where it was said of him that he followed God with all his heart like his father David. Now, there were some other good kings in uh, the kingdom of Judah, but only two, Josiah and Hezekiah, are the only ones where it said that they followed the Lord with all their heart like their father David. So, which, which is giving a huge compliment to these guys. But understand this. It means, it means that he pursued God with everything. But sometimes in your life, you may be faced with over... You know, it seems like odds that are just overwhelming. Some problems are just so great. But when we look at the story of Hezekiah today, it'll be a great model with how you can deal with these things. Because I have it up there. Because when Hezekiah was facing his problem, he did not despair. He did not panic. He did not give up. He turned to God in prayer. And you're going to find that out in the message today. See, because although Hezekiah followed the Lord, guess what? He still faced problems. He still battled things. There were still some things that happened. So remember, just because you are facing battles in your life at this moment, it does not mean that you have done anything wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean you've done something wrong because all of a sudden you're facing some type of opposition. All of a sudden you're facing some type of problem, some type of crisis has arisen. That does not mean necessarily that you've done something wrong. Sometimes you face battles because you are doing something right. You're not facing because you're doing something wrong. You're facing them because you are doing something right. The stories and the account we're going to be talking about Hezekiah today is actually um, recorded three times through the Bible. You can read about it in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19, Isaiah chapters 36 and through 39, and also 2 Chronicles 32. But what was Hezekiah's problem? Why did he pray? What drove him to prayer? He received a letter, and in this letter that he received, this is what drove him to pray. But why, why would this letter, why would a letter that he received cause him to go to God in prayer? Let's look at it and see. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 9 through 15, this is what we read. While King Sennacherib of Assyria was still besieging the town of Achish. He sent his officers, officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah and all the people in the city. This is what King Sennacherib of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you think you could survive my siege of Jerusalem? Hezekiah has said, the Lord our God will rescue us from the king of Assyria. Surely, Hezekiah is misleading you, sensing you to death by famine and thirst. I'm going to stop there a second. Do you understand why he's making a statement? Because what's he doing? I already told you. What is, what is he presently doing right now? Anybody remember what it says in Scripture? What is he presently doing? He's already besieging Lachish. Do you know what besieging means? He literally has his armies completely surrounded that city, surrounding that city, so there's no way for anybody in that city to escape. So, in other words, here's how, here's how a siege works. If you're outside the walls of a walled city, if you have supplies and you have water, all you have to do is outweigh the people inside the walls. Because eventually those inside the walls are going to, if they don't run out of water, what are they going to run out of? They're going to at least run out of food because there's always only so much storage they have inside a walled city. So basically, it's, it's a waiting game you play. So you just basically cut them off and say, okay, you can stay in there all you want. We'll, we'll just let you starve to death or just die of thirst. 
And literally, you know, so and that's why he makes the statement there that he makes, you know, Hezekiah is dooming you to, to, to famine and thirst. He says in verse 12, don't you realize that Hezekiah is the very person who destroyed? This, this is Sennacherib's understanding of the Jewish God, which he has no understanding at all. Because here's what he comes, I don't know if you understand the significance of this either. He's the very one who destroyed all the Lord's shrines and altars. He commanded Judah and Jerusalem to worship only at the altar, at the temple, um, and to offer sacrifices on it alone. Now, how many of y'all know anything about the Bible? How many of y'all know that's what the Jews were supposed to be doing? They were only supposed to be offering sacrifices and, all, and doing any type of things only at the altar in Jerusalem. Only at the altar in that temple in Jerusalem. They weren't supposed to be doing it in Bethlehem or, or Lachish or any other town in their nation. It was supposed to be done only... See, Sennacherib did not understand who their God was. Or let me, let me, let me clarify. Who their God is, was, and always will be. Right? Hopefully we have that understanding this morning. That he's a God who was, is, and always will be. Hence why we can go to him in prayer. He didn't get to, but you know, he, he's trying to trying to discourage them. He says, surely you must realize what I and the other kings of Assyria before me have done to all the people of the earth. Were any of the gods of those nations able to rescue their people from my power? Which, uh, which of their gods was able to rescue people from, from destructive power of my predecessors? What makes you think God can rescue you from me? Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Don't let him fool you like this. I say it again. No, no God of any nation or kingdom has ever been able to rescue his people from me or my ancestors. How much less will your God rescue you from my power? Can you say mistake? Number one. Or should we say the biggest mistake of all? Because sometimes, sometimes, our enemy may have some pretty impressive credentials. Because he did. Because everything up until this point, what he told Hezekiah and what he said in that letter to the people of Jerusalem was true. He lived, him and the kings before him of Assyria literally wiped the floor of every nation they went against. Did you hear what I said? They literally wiped the floor of every nation they went against. No one was able to stand against them. They were an empire at that time. They were expanding. They were growing. They, they, were, they, 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 were, they were taking over nations, taking their resources and their riches onto themselves, taking their people and either killing them or sending them out, sort of exiling them and using them as slaves. So everything Sennacherib has spoken to this point is true. But the mistake he makes is what, what we see there, what he says at the, in that last verse that we read. But like I said, sometimes our enemy has some very impressive credentials. And when we look at it, we're like, man, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But understand this. It doesn't matter how impressive their credentials are. That means nothing to our God who sits upon the throne in heaven. It compares in nothing to who he is. So what did Hezekiah do about this? In 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, it says this. After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherub. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen. To Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. This is what Hezekiah says, verse 17. It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations 
And they have thrown their gods, the gods of these nations, into the fire and burnt them. But of course, the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all. Only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O oh Lord our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O oh Lord, are God. Maybe Hezekiah, before all this happened, maybe some, you remember, he was someone who pursued God like his father David. Maybe just not too long before that, maybe he, some of the ones of his teachers came in, or maybe he picked up the scrolls of the Word of God, and maybe he read the, 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 the story about how all of a sudden his ancestor went out as a teenage boy and fastest, faced this overwhelming champion of the Philistine army. This guy who for 40 days held it, one dude, for 40 days, held an entire army shaking in their shoes and where they wouldn't do anything. Where when literally, he came out. They ran like little chickens. And I, with me, I would say, guys, you know, he can't take a hundred of us on at one time. Let's have, let a hundred go over and just kick his butt right now. But no. He came out and they ran. The whole army ran like scared rabbits. And here comes this teenage boy. He hears what's going on. And he says... Because Goliath, you know what I'm talking about, right? Goliath. Goliath says, I defy the God of the armies of Israel today. And then David, David took offense. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to stand out and blaspheme the God of Israel? Maybe Hezekiah just recently read that story. And he heard and he found out that, that Sennacherib is coming his way. And he says, you know what? If God did it once, God will do it again. And he probably read all the stories how God delivered David. How David encouraged himself when, well, when, he, when the odds seemed so far against him. God gave him great victories. Even though some of his predecessors up to this point weren't really living the way they should, but God did move some stuff in there. Maybe he, he remembered early about another one of his forefathers, a guy named Jehoshaphat. How the vast army came out against him. And he just put some praisers out there. God said, I'm going to deliver it. As he put praisers out there, all of a sudden, as they began to praise God, the enemy fell. Before they even got to battle, he said, God, I know you're not a one and done God. I mean, I don't know what was going through his mind, but maybe this is what was going through his mind. Maybe he remembers in the Psalms where he was encouraged to trust in the strength of the Lord, not to rely upon the strength of horses, but God's the one who delivers. I, I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what gave him his strength. But all I know is he didn't let it flinch. And he, but he tells the Lord, he says, it's true what he says. He says, but God, I want this done so the, so the world will know what? That you alone are God. See, you know, I, I, love, I love the expression that, that Jesus says, he took it and he spread it out before the Lord. It's like, have you, have you ever done, have you ever, have you ever maybe took, took a report from a doctor that said something or, or this or that, and you, you went to prayer and you just said, God, this is what they're saying, but I don't want to receive it. I'm believing in you. You just lay it out there before the Lord. He just, he just lays it out there before the Lord. See, Hezekiah's intercession begins with, with consciously recognizing who God is. He starts off just praising God. Isn't that what Jesus taught us to do in the model prayer? He says, when you pray, when you do this, he says, declare how it be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that what Jesus encourages us to do? And when we intercede, when we begin to, to seek God's face, we need to remember we're speaking to the one who alone is God over all the kingdoms of the earth. He alone is God. He alone has the final say. See, God has the power to resolve the seemingly overwhelming problems. Whatever we may face, He has the power to overcome them and to resolve them. Hezekiah's prayer was for God's honor and glory. He didn't do the same so these people would think that I'm something else. He wanted it out because He wanted all the kings of the world to know that you alone, O oh Lord, are God. That, that was the motive of his prayer. He was praying for the right reasons. And truly, he was pouring out all of his heart.
then God replied. God first off replied through the man of God, through a prophet. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 20 through 28, it says, Then Isaiah, son of Ahaz, Amos, sorry, Amos sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer by King Sennacherib of Assyria. And the Lord has spoken this word against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and laughs at you. The daughter of Jerusalem shakes her head in derision as you flee. Whom have you been defying and ridiculing? Against whom did you raise your voice? At whom did you look with such haughty eyes? It was the Holy One of Israel. By your messenger, you have defied the Lord. You have said, with my many chariots, I have conquered the highest mountains. Yes, the remotest peaks of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars and its finest cypress trees. I have reached its father's corners and explored its deepest forests. I have dug wells in many foreign lands and refreshed myself with their waters. With the sole of my foot, I stop up all the waters, also all the rivers of Egypt. Do you notice the theme that God is putting in his response to Sennacherib? Because Sennacherib was saying, I, me, he was saying, me, myself, and I. He, was, he himself was taking credit. And God goes on and he says, have you not heard? I decided this long ago. Long ago I planned it. And I am making, and I am now making it happen. I planned for you to crush fortified cities into heaps of rubble. That is why their people have so little power and are so frightened and confused. They are as weak as grass, as easily trampled as tender green shoots. They are like grass sprouting on a housetop, scorched before it can grow lush and tall. But I know you well. Where you stay and when you come and go, I know the way you have raged against me. See, God took this as a personal assault, a personal offense to him. He didn't say, okay, yeah, you were saying, you know, you weren't just saying it to his country, you were saying it to who? You were saying that to me. And because of your rage against me and your arrogance, which I have heard for myself, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the same road on which you came. I want to stop there a second. I've seen, I've seen this video posted from time to time on different things on Facebook. But there was a, like a comedian, um, I forget how long ago it was, but supposedly they, 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 were, they, were, they were talking on stage and they were sort of making fun of God and fun of Jesus. And, and somehow when it, they were saying something, says, so apparently, and again, and they didn't mean this as praise, they mean it as sort of a ridicule, mocking, whatever. Uh, apparently, he loves me most. And within a matter of seconds of them saying that, they collapsed on stage. Um, I'm here to tell you, the world needs to be careful how cocky they want to get yeah. with God. Because at a moment's notice, if he so desires, he <laughs> you know how I tell the story if it's me hanging on the cross? <laughs> Just imagine if God truly felt that way at one time because he said, you know what? You just got on my last nerve. And I'm, I'm going to show you that you aren't who you think you are. Now, thank the Lord he doesn't do that quickly and a lot as far as we know or else we'd have a whole lot of, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of messed up people. Well, they're, well, they're, yeah, that's all right. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you heard God's response. In fact, God didn't even stop there. In verse 32, he continues and he says, and this is what the Lord says about 
the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. That's great. But he didn't stop there. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. That's, that's pretty cool. But he didn't stop there. They will not march outside its gates with their shields nor build banks of earth against its walls. God, I don't know if you really understand what God's saying. God's saying, they're not going to even make it here. I will stop them before they get here. Yeah, they may have Lachish surrounded. I mean, he, he may think when he's done there, he's coming here. <laughs> he's not going to march outside your gates. They're not going to enter Jerusalem. Not even shoot an air. In fact, I said they're not going to even make it. He said the king will return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He will not enter the city, says the Lord. For my own honor, for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. I'm here to tell you, when you can get God get to a place like that in your life, also he says he can stand on your behalf and fight for you. I'm here to tell you, that's a place you want to be. Because I'm telling you, the enemy has no prayer. The enemy has no chance. And God did. God did deliver Assyria. Like God delivered Jerusalem from the Assyrians' uh, power. Because we read in verses 35 through 37, it says, That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed, what's that number? 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And when the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses Everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. And he went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. Now listen to this. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nishra. So he... He was in the temple. He was giving praise to his God who, who up until this point gave, in his mind, gave victory to his armies and his predecessors' armies before him over all these other nations. So he was in there giving his God praise. So this should, this should have been the place where he was the safest. Why? Because his God would be looking out for him because he protected him through all of these battles up to this point. And his sons, Adramalek and uh, Cherizer, yeah, killed him, killed, killed him with their swords. And then they escaped to the land of Ararat. And his other son, Esarhaddon, became the next king of Assyria. And I mean, can you say, wow. Again, where he thought he was the safest, God didn't even allow him down to battle. Which would have been an honor for a king. You know, the king of those days, if they wanted to die, they wanted to die with honor. They wanted to die in the, in, in the midst of battle. Oh, you know? Have you ever seen those movies where all, you know, we're going to die in battle. It's a glory to die in battle. But he died where it should have been one of the most secure places he could have been. And the fact is, it was his own sons who killed him. Sennacherib is not too big now, is he? See, too many times, too many times we, we look at things and, we, and we, we look at these situations and we think that maybe God, God, is, it's just overwhelming. Yes, yes, for us. I mean, for, for King Hezekiah and for Jerusalem on their own, they didn't stand a chance against Assyria. Because again, God killed how many soldiers? 185,000. And so there were, and it says, and when the surviving awoke. So we don't know how large the army could have been 200,000. I, I don't know. Could have been 250,000. Could have been 300,000. We, we don't know. 
But all we know is 185,000 soldiers died that day. And it was such a large amount that Sennacherib said, you know what? I need to return home. Maybe he was going home to maybe re remuster forces. I don't know. Yep. But God literally knocked him down to size. And I'm here to tell you, if we would just truly just keep our eyes focused upon God, God will knock our enemy down to size because nothing can compare with who our God is. See, Hezekiah in closing, Hezekiah experienced God's amazing blessings in his answer to his intercession because he did as Hannah did. And I want to encourage you to do the same as Hannah did and as Hezekiah did. Pray with all your heart. Pray for the right reasons. Be patient. That was Hannah. Then what did Hezekiah do? He did not despair. He did not panic. He did not give up. He did turn to God in prayer. If you begin to put some of these patterns, some of these habits in your life, I'm telling you, it will radically change your prayer life. And you'll begin to you'll be you'll see God begin to move and answer prayer in your life like never before. But what I'm going to do is our musicians are coming to get in place because we're going to end with a closing song here because we're going to declare because again what 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 more fitting song what we're doing yeah we could have we could have ended today with um, see a victory as we did in our worship we could have ended with I'm going to build my life upon you or nothing is impossible all those are part of what I want them to, I want you to think about them as we end our time together. All those are part of that they tie into what we've been talking about today. What we're mentioning about how God, God is able. God answers prayer. Amen. And I don't truly lose sight of that. But when you pray with our hearts, pray for the right reasons. Be patient. Do not despair. Do not panic. Do not give up. And do turn to God in prayer. I want to encourage you to seek His face. But I do have a corporate prayer I want us to pray today as we get ready in before we go into our worship. Because again, the song we're going to end with is Waymaker. How many of you know God is a Waymaker? No matter what has happened in your life, no matter what door has been closed or whatever, He's able to make a way where there seems to be no way. And, that, and as that one bridge of the song says, even when we can't see it, He's still working. Even when we can't feel it, he is still working. Amen. Amen. Yes. He can be trusted. He is the women. But before we get into that song this morning, I want us to corporately pray this prayer together. Lord, as we look around the condition of our state, our nation, and our world, we need your deliverance. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You made heaven and earth. Give ear, O oh Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O oh Lord, and see. Lord, would you pour out your Holy Spirit again? May we see people seeking your name again. May we see miracles of healing. May we see evangelization of our nation. May we see the revitalization of the church. May we see the transformation of society so that all kingdoms and people on earth may know that you alone, O oh Lord, are God. Amen. Let that be our prayer today. I want to see God awake in America again. Because as long as we have breath and as long as there's people who are still breathing in this country, it is not too late. God can still turn things around. Because our nation is not going the way it should go. We are walking further and further away from God all the time. We need to be called back to Him. We need God once again to awaken people. We Again, our nation doesn't... All these problems you see in our nation, that's not the cause. What The answer for all these problems is what? Jesus. Jesus. 
Our nation has a lack of Jesus problem. That's why we're going through what we're going through. We have the answer. And His name is Jesus. He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. They don't have to try to find the, the, their, their, to fill their longing with drugs, with alcohol, with sex, with witchcraft, whatever it may be. What they're truly looking for is a relationship with Jesus. He's the only one who will ever make their life complete. It won't be in another marriage or another boyfriend or girlfriend. The longing that they're trying to fill will only be filled, can only be filled with Jesus. We need to show them and reveal to them the way they So if you would stand with us. And let's begin to just worship him. And truly, as, as you sing or if you want to pray while you're there while we're singing, say, Lord, touch our nation, touch our state, touch our region, touch our county. We need you. Touch my neighborhood. Because how many of you know probably most of the people in your neighborhood probably are unsaved. Because the thing is, if they were to die today, the majority of people we know, if they were to die today, probably would not make heaven their home. They need Jesus. And we need to be concerned about it. We, we, we need to have a burden for that. They need Jesus. So again, let God stir our hearts so we can be Jesus to them, Jesus in the flesh to them. This world needs Jesus. They need a way maker. So as we enter in our time, let's declare who he is. However you need to pray, this altar, if you're going to, but let's just praise him and just ask him to be that way maker to declare it again. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working